good morning, everyone. Um, as you can see from my background, I'm actually in the office. So thank you for your prayer breakfast this morning. Got me to work very early. So it, and it's a blessing just to sit down this early in the morning and just listen to the word of God being read to us. Um, I want to thank all of the readers as well. Uh, but Sister Vivian, I think, read the portion that has been identified as the key phrase within this text. So if you'll permit me, I'd like to also say a word of prayer before we go any deeper. Dear God, thank you for allowing us to see a new dawn. Thank you for protecting us throughout the night. And as we spend some time focusing on your word, may your spirit speak to our hearts and may we indeed be transformed by what we have read and what we discuss. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as I said, it's the Vivian's portion of the scripture actually brought us in focus of what we're looking at today. The text is, a, the chapter is 31 verses, and we cannot speak about all of it this morning. But I want to bring out two key points that's within those texts. And verses 12 to 14 said, um, Moses said to the children of Israel, I'm looking up on my screen so in case it looks like I'm looking strange. Moses said to the children of Israel, uh, do not be afraid. This is verses 12 to 14. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord that the Lord will bring to you today. Also, the Egyptians you see today, will you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to stand still. Well, we'll be looking at how we stand still or what's required of us when we stand in still in a moment. But just want to share with you that that chapter is broken up into two parts. The first part of that chapter is Pharaoh pursuing the Israelites, verses 1 to 14. And the second part is the parting of the Red Sea, verses 15 to 31. I want to focus on, on the first part to talk about what we're reflecting on this morning, and we'll use the second part to pull it all together. So if we look at the first part of this text, what we will see in here, let's just bring it a little bit closer to me. In Exodus 14 and verse 3, we find that Pharaoh will be actually saying, this is what the Lord himself said, Pharaohs will be saying, they are wandering in a land of confusion. The wilderness has uh, the wilderness has boxed them in, just trying to read my Bible text here. But oh, wait a minute, if that's what Pharaoh is saying, the situation in Exodus 14 and verse 4 tells us what's going on within this text or within this chapter, because God is actually speaking and saying the Israelites are going to, they, the Egyptians will think that you are lost. But he says, I will gain honor by means of Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So what is it we're reading about this situation? Think of what happened. Moses said to the children of Israel, go the way God told us. Let's follow the way God told us. Well, where did God tell them to go to? If we look at verse um, the, the verse 2, the last portion of verse 2, it tells us that God said to the children of Israel to camp opposite Baal-Zephon. That's where you should camp just before the sea. So they are actually camping in front of an Egyptian place of worship. Based on what you've covered in the previous portion of, of, of the book of Exodus, the previous chapter, remember God was throwing all these plagues at the Egyptians, tackling all of their gods. The God of the Nile, the God of um, flies, the God of everything, you name it. He was actually battling with them. This was not a battle between God and the people of Israel, but it was God, the God of the universe, and Pharaoh who believed he's God of, of everything. And all of these battles were going on. And where did God bring them? And we know God won every single one of those battles. And now he said, camp opposite their workplace of worship. 
So there they are, camping up opposite the place of worship for the Egyptians to have the Red Sea behind them. Where are they going? What are they going to do? Why will God place his people in that situation, as he said, so that Egypt and Pharaoh will understand I am the one who has the power? I wonder if that's the only reason why God placed them there. We'll find that out when we get to the back at the end of this verse, or of this chapter. So let's look at this for us, for our personal situation. The situations we sometimes find ourselves in are meant to glorify the God we serve. Even when we are the ones who cause the calamity, even when we are the ones our behaviors cause us to be in this situation, and the consequences of our behavior means that our backs are against the wall, or as we've been studying this quarter, we are in a crucible. When we confess that we are the ones who got it wrong, when we confess, Lord, I recognize that I'm only in this corner because of my behavior, my actions. God is graceful. He is kind. And once we truly confess, as we know, he will forgive us and bring us out of the situation. The consequences will still leave marks on us, but he will bring us out. So what's happening for Israel? Is there something Israel did why God has put their backs against the wall? Is there a challenge that we are not seeing as we read this chapter? God said to the people, go forward, don't go back, don't give up, just keep going forward. Well, Lord, to go forward, we're going to drown. He said, still go forward. Whatever happens, do not turn back. How many times have you been in a situation where you think, I just need to give up. I need to walk away. I need to go back to what I used to do before because this situation is not helping me. God says, go forward. So there are times when those who are attempting to overthrow us, to challenge us, to create situations for us, they look on and they laugh and they say, yeah, surely they're not going to get out of this situation. Let me just sit back and look and see the destruction that's coming to them. Because there's two different sorts of situations we find ourselves in where our backs are against the wall. Either something we've done or something the people against us has done. But either way, God says, keep going forward. Come on, God, I can't take this anymore. I need to step aside. He say, no, I don't want you to step aside. There's some learning that needs to come out of your situation. So who's learning? What are they learning? Our faith may waver, but until the Holy Spirit comes through and breaks through our despair, we will not remember that God is in control. We need something to open our eyes and say, God is leading in this situation. So when the Israelites' faith wavered, Moses said to them, as we saw in our key text, don't be afraid, stand firm. You will see the salvation of the Lord and you will you see what he will accomplish in your life today. The Egyptians you see, the enemy you see, and the problems that we have, all of the situations we find ourselves in, God is saying to them, you will never see this again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to stand still. Now that's encouraging. Most people have the idea that to stand still or to wait it's just do nothing. I sit back, fold our arms, and wait for God to do what he needs to do. But that's not true. This is not what the Bible means when we say, when God says wait, when he says stand still. It's to stand still or to wait in the Bible from God's perspective. It's an action verb. To stand still, it means that we now need to be alive in our faith. During those difficult times, we need to trust God. He will bring us through the problems. He will bring us through the trials. He will bring us through the, the, the tragedies that we're facing. So I still wonder, who is God teaching a lesson to in this chapter? So let's keep looking at what the chapter is saying. For the Israelites, it looks as though they are not gaining any ground. The more they, move, they go forward, it's the more they, they would lose as far as they can see. They think that they're on a losing path, but God is saying, no, you're on a winning path. 
but there's darkness, there's water, there's problems. Keep going forward. So in those two parts of the text, chapters one, chapter 14, verses 1 to 14, we see what's happening for the Israelites. We see Pharaoh's pursuing them. We see that they seem so there's no way out. And the chapter tells us that God sent them in this situation to see that so that the Egyptians will see God's intervention. And they will, ex they will express their conviction that the Lord God of heaven is fighting for Israel. And that's exactly what we learned in that chapter, verses 1 to 14. It finishes by saying, Egypt saw that God was the ruler. He was the one who was going to win. But there are two sets of players in this chapter. There are the Egyptians and there are the Israelites. So if the Egyptians have to learn something, what is it that the Israelites have to learn in this chapter? And in verses 15 to 31, that's where we saw where the lessons were really being learned. It's not until the Israelites saw the Egyptians lying dead that they started to fear God and put their trust in him and put their trust in Moses. So if you work your way back, we've already read the chapter. You don't need me to read through the words. Do you remember what he, they said to the people of Israel, said to Moses? When they saw that there were problems, why did you bring me here? Could you not have just left us where we were? Could you not just allow us to be buried in, in, in Egypt? Did you bring us out here so that we could be destroyed? So here's the question. Who needs to learn about the power of God here? We already finished the first part. The Egyptians have learned the power of God. But what about the Israelites? Do they understand the power of the God they are serving? Do they understand who he is and what he will do for them? Well, I don't know about you, but when I read chapter um, 14, it looks as though these Israelites have no idea who's this God, who this God is. They are used to the God they can see or the gods they can see in Egypt. They were there for 400 years. They have forgotten, and some of them have never even understood who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is. They never really had a relationship with him to understand his power. And God needed to teach them, hey, I am your sustainer. I am your provider. I am your deliverer. And the only way he could do this was to place them in a situation where they had to rely on, them, on him. And here they are now recognizing who the protector is. So how does the first, the second part of the chapter finish? In If you look at verses 30 to 31, having come up against their back against the wall, having been brought through the Red Sea, now the Israelites have learned their lesson. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the shore. Now there's a transformation. Now there is a change beginning among the people of Egypt. Remember, we know the end of the story. They don't. They don't know what will be coming next. We know what's coming next. But pretend you don't know what's coming next and look at where they are right now. At the, on the other side of the Red Sea, the Egyptians dead on the shore, and now they are raising their hands in praise. The Lord is our God. They fear him. They believe who he is, and they believe in his servant Moses. They didn't before. They do now. And sometimes, my friends, when we have challenges in our lives, Sometimes God has to teach us and remind us of the power that he has, of the powerful God that we serve. So the situations you're in, as I close, is not only to teach the, pe teach the people who's looking on in your situation, it's not only to teach them about the power of God, it's to teach us about the power of the God who can deliver us. So don't see your situations as something that other people has placed us in. Ask ourselves, what can I learn from this situation? Okay, so chapter 14 of Exodus has so many strong points. 
you raise them in your discussion. But every time we read the Bible, it needs to do something to us and for us. It needs to transform us. We cannot walk away just gaining more knowledge and having learned something for ourselves and behave differently because of what we have learned. So I mentioned to you about a couple of the learnings in there. Matthew Henry, in his commentary on chapter 14, said, it is a righteous thing that with God to put those under the impression of his wrath who have long, let me just make sure I get the right, who have long resisted the influences of his grace. It is spoken in this way of triumph over the obstinate and presumptuous rebels. Oh my goodness, that's a harsh thing for Matthew Henry. He's saying that we can say on the face of the verse, of the, of the commentary, that he's saying that the Egyptians were obstinate and presumptuous rebels. But as we learn to the end of chapter 14, the Israelites were also obstinate and presumptuous rebels. Okay, before you clash, you know, say to me, come off the screen, that's not right. Look at what happened. Sister Joanne was saying, when they were walking through the Red Sea, were they scared? Did they think the water were crashing on them at any time? They just saw God perform so many miracles in Egypt. They just saw him send all these plagues on Egypt, and they were scared. So they knew they were selected specially by God. We know we are selected specially by God. We've seen the miracles in our lives, but yet still, we remain obstinate and we remain rebellious. God forgive us. So the chapter began with the Egyptians learning about the Lord in verse 4 and learning about his power, and it closed with Egypt, with Israel learning about the power of God. Bear in mind what happens. Bear in mind what happens. As the chapter closes, it shows that it wasn't until the Israelites saw the Egyptians dead on the shore. My friends, what would it take for us to truly believe in God? What exactly are we waiting for before we will fully believe that God is a mighty God? Let us not wait to see total destruction of others. Let us recognize from now that when God places us in crucibles and difficult situations, it's not to destroy us, but it's to grow us. It is to grow us like he grew the people of Israel. Yes, we know, because we know the end of the book, that they will still rebel. They will start making noise again. They will give Moses a hard time. But sometimes God has to remind us that when he places us in this situation, our transformation means we cannot be the way we were before. When he selects his leaders, it is God who puts our leaders up and it's God who takes them down. When he selects his leaders, it's not for us to rebel against them. God had to put Moses Right there in the limelight, as one of the sisters shared, he wasn't afraid to share his leadership. He placed Moses in that place, in that situation. So the people of Israel, though they were not looking to God at that time, they would look at his servant. And sometimes that's what happens. Because we're not looking high enough, he placed the leaders in front of us so we can learn from the leaders. So I know there are leaders on the screen at the moment, and I want to say to all the leaders, my fellow pastors and elders on the screen, and led leaders of departments, we are sharing a limelight with God. He has blessed us to give us that opportunity. But remember that our trust is also important in, in what God can do. Let us not rebel against him. Let us not rebel against his leadership. Let us, all the people he's chosen, let us learn and be transformed by what we have read in chapter 14, just like the Egyptians learned and were transformed, and just like the Israelites learned and was transformed. God bless you. 
as you go through this day and the continued readings. God bless.